Hey, what's up? It's Wednesday. We are back at against hump day. Spiritual growth. We are back. We are back. Thank you all for tuning in and joining me um, tonight. Man, we got a, another good one tonight. Um, we'll be covering 1 Samuel, coming 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. But before I get into that, I'd like to say thank you to everyone that sent me a message, a, a private message, or a shout out on Facebook for me being ordained this past weekend. Thank you so much for that wonderful uh, show of love and appreciation and encouragement as I continue on in my calling in the ministry. Next is I'd like to go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Be real quick. Father God, almost high. You are so powerful and you are so great. Thank you so much for everything that you have done for us in the group of spiritual growth. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit that is within us helps us comprehend everything that is being said and taught tonight. In Jesus name, I pray. Amen. All right, let's get it going. All right. Like I said, first Samuel chapter eight, verses one through 10. I'm going to be covering three points of of um, insight into this scripture. And this is kind of long, so I won't go through all of it at one um, swoop, but I will get the highlights here on, the, on reading the scripture. The first part I want to read is verse eight, I mean, verse uh, one through three. Now it came to pass that Samuel was old and he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his first, uh, firstborn was Joel and the name of his second son, son, um, Abijai, they were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after uh, after being dishonest and gain, dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Going on to verse four. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and, and said to him, look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to the judges like all of the nations. But the thing that displeased Samuel when they said this is give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord and the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all they say to you. They have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them according to all the works which they have done so since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods. So, are there, so they are doing so to you. Now, therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them behavior of the king who will reign over them. All right, so that is verses 1 through Nine. All right. Have you ever had a situation that you kept wanting something so bad, you kept asking for it, and it just never got there? And then one day out the blue, your prayer gets answered. And it's nowhere near what you thought it would be. That's what... Israel is finding out here or getting foretold and forewarned on the future king who is about to be named king here right, before, right after this is Saul. OK, so to give a good background here, after they left, after the Israelites left Egypt and Moses passed on, they had a bunch of judges, not kings, but judges, and they governed themselves. But what happened over all of the stuff that happened in Judges and in, and in Samuel was anointed as a prophet, Samuel was running a certain section of Israel, of the tribes. And his he was getting old and his two sons was, well, you know, was able-bodied. So he said, okay, y'all two run this. The problem with this is his two sons took advantage of the opportunity and basically went out the monetary gain and bribes and, and things like of that nature because they was magistrates over the area, basically judging and and and, and um, being the judges for a conflict. So where I'm going with this is I want you to understand that don't let one 
bad decision leads you to a worse decision. Because this is what is happening here. The bad decision that was made was by Samuel telling his sons to be judges. It's the first bad decision that he made. Okay. The second bad decision, which was made by the Israelites, is asking for a king like the other nations. All right. It's important to note that when you make a mistake of trusting someone to do a job or complete a task, they're not doing as good as you like them. Don't like what you would like. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Meaning that even though Samuel's sons wasn't doing a good job, that doesn't mean you just completely flip over to we just need a king and everything would be so much easier to do. Mind you now, it's only two people that was doing something wrong. Why would you want to switch over to a whole monarchy here and having a king? So what do you do when a decision we've made has not put us into a favorable outcome? And this is where we're at right now. We've made a decision and it has not put us in a favorable outcome. So what, what do we do? There are three steps to help you get back on track. The first one is acknowledge that you have made a mistake. First off, out the gate, say, you know what? I made a mistake. Stop. I made a mistake. Ask God for advice and consideration of what other people would like. That's the second step. Once you realize you made a mistake, ask God for advice and also include the advice in your prayer and your conversations with God, what other people have said to see what answer you get back. Third thing is follow, <laughs> this is going to be simple, follow what God tells you to do, all right? Let's, let's hone in a little bit on the first point. When you acknowledge that you have made a mistake, two things are going to happen. Number one, a solution is going to form instantly. As soon as you acknowledge that you have a problem, a solution will form. The second thing that happens that's going to come over you is the is the notion of forgiveness, because if you was the one that made the mistake and you acknowledge the mistake. Right. Then at that point. You can feel that forgiveness of yourself for making a mistake, because, you know, you now have a chance to fix the mistake. If it's someone else that you put in charge as if uh, as. Uh, Samuel did, put his sons in charge, he can forgive them for what they have done when the solutions start coming into play. All right? It's important to, to grasp that. Samuel's decision to have his sons judging over, uh, over him, for him, was one of the worst decisions Samuel made. His sons were made of the same, wasn't, won't made of the same stuff Samuel was. Remember, Samuel was dedicated to God by his mother, Hannah, who begged God for a child. Hannah's prayers were answered and Samuel was born. And she, and at that point, dedicated Samuel, the child, to God. So out the gate, Samuel was anointed. Okay? So now that doesn't mean that his sons... His offspring don't have the ability to have some of the stuff that Samuel has. But what we see from scripture, they was not walking in his ways. So, so, so quickly you can find out that, okay, Samuel, these kids that you have are not walking the way you walked with God. Now, now certain scholars will tell you that the spirit of the Lord was on Samuel. So it's not like what we have today with the Holy Spirit being in every believer, because now we have Jesus Christ that gifted us that, right? Samuel does not have, uh, he has the same spirit, but his sons did not have the same spirit in them. So follow that, okay? So, but in us, the anointing needs to be activated by faith, and actions, faith, and then you have to act on it. So even you listening to me right now, as a believer, you have the Holy Spirit within you. He is in you and sitting beside you as you're watching this video right now. 
but you have to activate it with faith and believe that he is there to help you out, to help you get to your purpose in the kingdom. Let's take a look at the scripture here real quick. So in, in uh, the first verse, now it came to pass Samuel was old and that he made his sons judges over Israel. Samuel's sons committed two sins, two of them. They did not walk in the way of their father. You are supposed to walk in the way of your father. You should be, the, you know how to say the apple don't fall too far from the tree? Them apples fell a long ways away from the tree when it came to Samuel. But they did it on their own accord. The second sin that, that the sons um, took part in is they took advantage. They took advantage of people's trust and people trusting this is Samuel's sons. So therefore, we know they straight. We know they brought, brought up right. They took advantage of that. They took advantage of the access Check this out now. They took advantage of the access that they had, the authority that they had. See, see, when you remember, when you're put in charge of something, you, when you're younger, you don't really get it. Like, oh, wow, I get, good, I get stuff. I get access to things. But when you get older, you think of it a little bit differently. You think of the reasons why you want to have access or want to get that promotion. OK, it's because you get access to things. But when you're younger, you look at it as an advantage over people and an advantage that you have personally. Well, I should say, as you get mature, you start thinking of certain ways instead of older. Let's take it back in the day. Remember in high school. Uh, some of y'all, you got to think a little farther back, but some of us, it's not that far back. Remember the hall pass? You used to covet getting that hall pass. If you was born in class, you would fake having to go to the bathroom just so you could get in the hallway to see who you, who you could see. So now you're walking with this pass, and, it, and all of a sudden, you would walk past the person that was the hall monitor. Now, the hall monitor was there to make sure that everyone that was in the hall had a purpose to be in the hallway and out of class and also having the hall pass. And then they may ask you, where are you headed to? You may say, I'm going to the bathroom or I'm going to the principal's office or I'm going to get a, a pack of paper for my teacher. But the hall monitor was always lurking around, making sure that you had your pass and reason to be outside of the classroom. So the, the, the next coveted thing to, to have was to be the hall monitor. Not just have the hall pass, but you're outside being a hall monitor. Now, imagine now if you've ever been a hall monitor and now you have the advantage over everybody that's walking in that hallway. You can blow them in or you can give them grace. Because we all know that when one of our friends became the hall monitor, we couldn't wait to be able to try to get the hall passed. I mean, we could be at Roman the Halls the whole class period and miss the entire class thinking like we're going to the bathroom. But really, we're out there talking to everybody else. Or while the teacher is being born, they're up on the board and, and, they're, and their back is turned. You slip out in the hallway without your pass. You don't have nothing to worry about because your homeboy or your homegirl is outside as the hall monitor, and they're not going to tell on you. See, when you get to be the hall monitor, certain stipulations dictate who is the hall monitor, who's not. And a lot of times that stipulation is your honesty and integrity. Because not everybody got to be the hall monitor. And you had to be good in class and respectful in order to be that hall monitor. That's why it made it so special if you had a friend that became the hall monitor because they was able to be good enough to be the hall monitor and then give you access to the advantage to not be in trouble if you got caught in the hallway. So. Recognize why you got the opportunity to have access 
someone trusting you, you to do the right thing. And that's the same thing that they trusted Saul's kids to do. So you have to pay attention to that. You have been on the other side of that hall monitor in your life as well. When you've ran across somebody who wanted to take disadvantage of you, when you had your hall pass and someone that was the hall monitor that did not like you and told on you or just flat out lied on you, saying that you wasn't in the bathroom. We've been in them type situations. Now, I may be talking about the hall monitor right now, but what about your job? What about your job in the place that you work at? Have you had someone lie on you and say that you was doing something you wasn't supposed to be doing? Or they told you that you, they said that you took a pack of pens and you know good and well you did not. Have you had that happen to you? It's not a good feeling. Now, the second point. Asking God for advice for what you should do along the way while presenting what other leaders are suggesting. Now, this is quite key because we normally, when we go to God for uh, uh, for prayer and, and, and advice, we go with what we think we may should do. God, is this the right thing for me to do? Right. But we kind of leave out the advice that other people and other leaders have told us or gave us advice or suggestions of what we should do and present that as well. So, the Lord, this is what I think I should do. And this is what other people think I should do. Lord, what is it do you think I should do? See, some of us are praying to God, but are not actually having a meeting with God. See, this, there's a difference. See, some people sit in and pray, and then they have a prayer is really just asking questions and they're not really waiting for an answer. It's similar to you picking up the phone and you call and somebody doesn't answer, you just leave a what? A voicemail. And then you hang up the phone waiting for them to call you back. Or or how you would text somebody, right? And a question and put the phone down and wait for a response. That's what prayer is. What I'm asking you to do tonight in this situation, I want you to have a full-blown meeting with God. See, a meeting with God is a little bit different, and you see the meeting with God here that Samuel is having with God. This is a full-blown meeting. This isn't a, I'm going to pray and then hang up the phone and wait for a response. No, Samuel prayed and kept praying because he was having a meeting with God, okay? So when you're having a meeting with God, you have to be prepared to be there a while, okay? You got to be prepared to be there a while. You need my, my even have to pack a lunch. Have you ever heard of, of some pastors, they say, we go, I'm going to go on a fast and pray over it. What they're talking about is they're going to go on a fast and they will have multiple meetings with God to find out what the answer or what they should do about this situation. You've got to have that meeting with God. In verse 6, we see Samuel praying to God, and immediately God responds. Okay, he says, he says, but the thing displeased Samuel, then they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord answered. Meeting has started. God's immediate response moved the prayer into a meeting with God. So if you sit down to pray about something and that Holy Spirit starts talking to you, now you're in a meeting. I want you to stay in there, stay compacted in there, stay focused on what God is trying to convey to you. Now, you may not think that you don't have the same access to Sam as Samuel had, because with all due respect, he was anointed. You're saying, CB, Samuel was anointed by God, dedicated by Hannah. Look, look at the whole story. That ain't me. But I'm here to tell you the good news. The good news, it is you. Because Jesus Christ chose you. He anointed you when you became a believer. So he is residing within you. 
The Holy Spirit is within you just like how he was in Samuel. So you have the same access to God as Samuel does. So you have the same ability to be able to speak and have a meeting with God. You hear me? So therefore, it's time is now to start having those meetings. You're in situations right now that you think you can't get out of or you think you should be in or get into that you're waiting for an opportunity or breakthrough. It's time to have a meeting. Start praying to God and have that meeting. I'm going to tell you a quick story. As, as, as a supervisor, if you see someone not performing to the best of their ability and you start to notice a slight drop off, I, as a supervisor, may pull in, might pull you to the side and, and say, look, I need to talk to you for a minute. I see you're not performing like you should be. OK, see, like when with Samuel's sons, I would have pulled them to the side and say, hey, what's going on, man? You're not y'all not doing stuff the right way. And then if the situation gets really bad, I will call you in for a meeting, a full bloom meeting, because we're at the point that we need to have a sit down meeting. See, this is somewhat what God was doing with Samuel. We're beyond just answering the prayer very quickly. We need to have a meeting. So Samuel goes to God thinking that he is about to get chastised for appointing his sons. And what's interesting about this is God does not focus on his sons being bad. He focuses on the children of Israel always asking to have a king. And he's fed up with it at this point. And, 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 and because he's fed up with it, he is going to grant their wishes. This is why I call this message, be careful what you ask for. So when you're having that meeting and, and you're having that meeting with a person or they're having it with you and it's going over something that's negative, you got to make sure that you sit back and you listen because a lot of times the whole meeting may not even really be about you. It could be about everything. The third point is following what God says to do is easy to do sometimes because it may be contrary to all understanding and logic that you may have. So what's really you get that 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 Proverbs, uh, I can't remember the, the verse, but it says, lean not to your own understanding. That's where that comes in at. Because a lot of times what God's response to your prayer may not make any sense to you. Because God's response to Samuel's prayer kind of really doesn't make much sense because why would you want, it's like, okay. You want me to tell them to grant them that you want a king, even though I know you don't want them to have a king. But sometimes you got to be careful what you ask for because you just might get it. So he is verse seven. It says, and the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people and all that say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. See, God wants to reign over the people of Israel, but they're saying we don't want that. We want a king. We want somebody we can reach out and touch. So what we get from that is in verse nine. So now, therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall some solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. <coughs> Excuse me. So check this out. He gives Samuel the task of saying, okay, Samuel, you tell them they got it, they're getting the king. But then also tell them what comes with getting a king. Now, if you keep reading on, it's a good two paragraphs of negative stuff that you get 
when you subscribe to having a king over you versus having God over you. And that, my friends, I'm going to cover uh, next week. All right. But it's interesting that God will give you what you ask for if you keep asking for it. And but sometimes he will give it to you just to show you why you shouldn't want it. So if you have something that you've been praying for and it seemed frivolous or or if you take a back, take a step back from it, why am I asking for that? Because, like, I will tell you, I've told you all this story before. I had prayed one time for an, an Audi A8. That's what I wanted. Audi A8. And I finally got one. And for two and a half years that I had that car, I caught pure hell with that car. That car was in and out of the shop the whole time. I kept asking for it. God finally gave me the access to get it. I got it and then paid a price for it, which was time and frustration. He gave me the ability to understand why he was trying to not give me that car. Another one is, remember as a kid, y'all, at Halloween, and you went out trick-or-treating, and you would come back home with a bag full of candy. You know, when I was coming up, you had to dump the candy on the table, so make sure ain't nothing crazy in there. Right. And then you I'm sitting there eating that candy and you may have done the same thing in the candy. But then your mom tells you right about seven thirty, eight o'clock after you've gotten trick through trick or treating is you should not eat too much candy. Don't eat too much candy. And what you say to yourself, well, I'm, I got all this candy here. I'm going to keep eating. You basically had a buffet of candy as a kid. And you're getting everything you want, which is nothing but pure sugar. But your mom or your dad told you one time not to do it, maybe even twice. But then after that, they say, you know what? Go ahead, because your stomach going to hurt. That's exactly what God told Samuel to tell them. Go ahead, but your stomach going to hurt. And but what we do as kids, we sit right there and we ate that candy and to the point our stomach started hurting and then now at night our stomach is cramping because we ate a whole bag of starbursts along with some Reese pieces something that don't even go together but your kids you got to learn sometime so when god is chastising you or other people for treating people the way that they have treated him listen to every word that he is telling you. So if he, he meaning God, recognizes that you are getting the same treatment that he gets, and he goes to start chastising them in your prayers, I want you to pay close attention to what he says because that is the instructions that he's about to give you, and you need to follow those instructions because they're coming directly from God. Also, when someone is bent on doing what they want to do and clearly warn them of the decisions of, of their actions in everything and back away. Because, you know, if you're being a good friend to somebody, you told them, hey, don't do X, Y, Z or stay away from them. And they go do it anyway. Back up. So I'm good. Good friend of mine said, if they grown, leave them alone. Right? After you've told them, let it go. The good news is that God is using all things for the benefit of the kingdom, so everything is a win-win. So even if somebody is coming after you, hating on you, lying on you, and you feel like it may be working, and then all of a sudden it don't work, and you say, I went through all of that, but guess what? Everything works for the benefit of the kingdom. So therefore, everything is a win-win. And that's what we find out here in this story, because we all know what's getting ready to happen with Saul and, and, and in the situation with David, right? But this is how we get Jesus down the line. So God was able to take this, what's happening right now, and make something good out of it. And then we're able to hear this story to be able to help you today at 2023 on how to deal with a situation like this, when you got people asking for something 
that they've been asking for and be careful for what they pray for and what they ask for. So in review, the three steps that will help you get back on track after making a mistake is acknowledging that you have made a mistake, asking God for advice and the consideration of other people uh, in the whole situation, and following what God says to do. Those are the three steps. Samuel had an awesome advantage of being blessed with the spirit of the Lord. But as believers, we have the same direct access to the same spirit. He's always waiting to hear from you. He loves seeing you succeed in life and has a purpose for you in the kingdom. Okay, He has a purpose for you. If that after hearing this and you want to become a believer, all you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Ask him to come into your life and to come into your heart. And at that moment, we believe that you are born again. If you have done that, please send me a direct message on YouTube, Facebook, or on the Facebook group. Send me a direct message, and I'll be sure to get back with you to get you in a good Bible-based church. Thank you all so much for joining me tonight. I have got 631. I went over about one minute. I hope you have a great day and wonderful hump day. Father God, most powerful, thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. Thank you for your word of wisdom, and thank you for everything that you've done with that situation with the prophet Samuel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good night, everybody.